Hi everyone, welcome to lecture 11. So what we're going to do for this one is just go through some things about human resources and how we plan for families to be involved. So the main things we're looking at today are how you plan for behaviour, just very quickly. I know you've covered this in other units and you will be covering it more in different units. A little bit about the environment that you must plan for. And then our main focus is planning for the human resources part. So what I want you to keep in mind is that the art of teaching is the art of assisting discovery. So it's about us doing the planning to make sure that it works really well in our classroom or in our learning centre. So if we want things to work really well, one of the first things we really have to think about is how we plan to minimise behaviours that are going to cause us issues. So the main thing is to think, how do you plan to prevent the behaviour problems before they even occur? And this is where if you do good planning, you can circumvent and avoid, I reckon, somewhere between 80 and 90% of your behaviour problems. A lot of your behaviour problems from children who are having regulation issues or who are informed by trauma and lots of different things that are going on in their little worlds is that if you set up the right processes inside the classroom, then you will end up with very minimal behaviour issues. So our key considerations. First thing to do is to make sure that you really develop some good relationships with the children in your classroom. I know we say it all the time, but it is so crucial. Children will behave and they will want to learn for someone who they know likes them. So if you don't like them, they pick it up. Even though you might think you're not showing it and you're behaving the same way with them, you have to have a good, positive relationship with the children. The second thing is that you've got to have that nice balance between the clear rules and the balances with you're praising the good behaviour. You're not giving them mindless, endless praise, but you're reinforcing all the things that you want to see happening in the classroom that lead to positive experiences for you and for the children. And you'll see that children in the early years, they respond so well to that praise and that realignment of their beliefs and what they know is good things to do in the classroom. So when we do our planning, we always want to provide a good level of structure and we want to make sure we've set up our schedules so that we can plan ahead. So we want the children to know that, you know, there is a guest speaker coming in this afternoon or we've got something different that's going on. So the children have to know that straight after lunch, instead of going out to play, they're going to come back inside. So plan ahead, help the children understand what's coming up and it will make your life much, much easier. And finally... This comes into our third thing that we're looking at today, which is all about our human resources. But you want to work as a team with all your caregivers. So that means that you and your educational assistants must have the same philosophy and the same way of dealing with behaviours. You don't want to have one where you're telling them off for something because they're not following the rules. But then when they do the same thing with one of the EAs next to them, they're allowed to do that particular thing. And it could be as simple as where they're allowed to climb or what they're allowed to throw and so on in a classroom. So you must work together so that you have those rules and praise all works and is the same between all of the adults who are in the room. So when we're thinking about how we plan to provide good experiences, we have to think how we are going to make sure that we provide structure and schedules and how we make sure that we think about the opportunities we have to develop some good relationships. So you want to think about how you can use your own lesson plans and your forward planning documents to show how you're going to be planning to prevent those potential issues. So that's why we ask you in your lesson plans to plan for transitions, to think about what are the problems that you will have when you want to move kids around. So let's think about our key things that could potentially cause our behaviour issues. So some of them are transitions from one thing to another, from inside to outside, from painting into um, washing their hands. How are they going to move from one place to the other? Transitioning from sitting on the mat to moving to your tables. You don't just send them all away and have them run riot. So you think about your transitions at every point in time when they are physically moving or 
when they're cognitively transitioning from one type of learning to another type of learning. So always think, how do you plan for those? It doesn't just mean you put half a phrase on your lesson plan that says, move children from mat to tables. Think about how are you going to group them? How are you going to organize them? How is that going to be written up? How are you going to make sure that there are ways that they share the equipment and the materials? So you might use the peg system on your construction area where there are four pegs attached to the construction area sign and then the children pop the pegs onto their clothing and all the people with the purple pegs, they get to stay in the construction. It could be that the children just know that one, two, three, four, that's all that's allowed in there. So think about your equipment and your materials. You might have um, simple things. I find painting shirts are the funny one that always makes me laugh. For some reason, children get paint everywhere on the shirts, on themselves, on everything else. So how are you going to plan to minimize that paint going everywhere? How are you going to plan for the movements or change in locations? So we want to think, Yes, we do want to move from inside time to outside time, from outside time back to inside time. You might have specialists where you have to take them off to music or to sport or something like that. So how are you going to transition and how are you going to create the right movement where we don't have 28 five-year-olds all running from one place to the next? Because that's a danger for lots of people and it ends up with their behavior escalating in lots of different ways that are not in a positive manner. So think about how you're going to plan for that. Are you going to move them a group at a time? Are you going to have your EA take half of the children and you take half of the children? Are they going to have some of them sitting on the mat while the rest move into the different locations and so on? So you want to plan for all of those. You need to plan for messy activities. I love to do messy activities in the classroom. It's so much fun. But I have to think, is it a messy activity that's easy to clean up? Or is it a messy activity where I need to think about what they're wearing and I need to think about where it is in the classroom? So if I'm doing glue, then glue's easy enough to clean up. I can just wipe it and so on. If I'm doing handprints and footprints and things like that, that's an outside one where then we have our buckets where we're set up so the children can wash their hands. If I'm doing something like oobleck, that's really, really messy. So that goes on the grass. So then I can just wash the grass down. Yes, I can do them inside, but messy activities, I just need to think about where I set them up and how I can make sure that I don't get upset at the mess that they make as opposed to if I plan for it, the mess won't be an issue. Yes, it's going to be messy, but it's easy to clean up for the adults in the room. I have to think what are some things that are going to excite the children because when children get very excited, they often forget some of their good behaviours and they get too excited. So I have to plan for things that might excite them and how I'm going to manage that. So I had the bubble man come out one time with my little kindy kids and they were just beyond excited with what was going on. So we scheduled different kids so that they could have lots of hands on time because if I had have had them all sitting on the mat, all doing it at the same time for the whole time, they wouldn't have had enough hands on experiences. Whereas this way they got to do something else. We kept them occupied and then they went out as a small group and had their own hands on time with the giant bubbles and things that they made. So I have to think, those things excite the kids. So I have to plan for that. And then obviously we've got visitors that come into our room or we just have different people who are coming into our room. And it could be that the visitors are people who are coming in to do an incursion with us. It could be that we have people who are visiting who are important so they might be doing an audit on our centre and so on. So I have to help the children understand how they behave when there are strangers in the room. It could be that I have parent helpers. I find when the dads come on to be parent helpers that some of the children go a little bit naughty because they're so excited that a dad is there. But again, I just have to change what I'm doing so that I can minimise those behaviour problems. 
And then changes in routines, things like when the sports carnival is on and the children are all going out to watch or they might have their one little race that they're doing and so on. So I plan those even two or three days ahead of time and it's written on our planning schedule so the children know that it's coming up and that they can be prepared for that change in routine that they're going to have. So they're my things that I have to think if I plan for each of those appropriately and I really consider them and I put that into my forward planning documents and in my lesson plans, it means that I'm minimizing the behavior problems that I will encounter. So now I need to think about my environment. So with my environment, there's entire units that you, I think you've already done one, but some things that you want to think about are these three main things. You want to think about how much space you have in your center. So there's lots of things that say, oh, you need to have all of these different learning areas and so on. But think about what is the space. If you are in a center that is blessed with space, you can set up large areas or you could set up multiple smaller areas. It's your choice of how you want to do it. You have to think about things like your lines of sight. So you don't want to create lots of hidden areas because then you don't know what's going on in those hidden areas. So you've got to think about your use of space that you have. Think about the children that you have in your room. So if you have some children who are very quiet and reserved, they might need to have some cushions on the floor and a very quiet center draped with a cloth and so on, where they can feel that they have a private area to go to. You might have children who are quite uh, having difficulties understanding how to share so you need to have very open lines of sight so you always think about the way that you set your classroom up is determined by the children in your classroom now our third one to think about with your environment is your learning centers so how many learning centers why are you setting those learning centers up what spaces do they need can they walk between them can they easily go from the painting to the taps can they go from the play-doh into something else so what have you got and how much space do they need have they got a nice big mat area for their construction center are you putting out the giant blocks so therefore they need to have a giant space and so on so always think with your learning centers plan for it so that then it's actually written in and that will minimize behavior problems and it'll also help you understand how you literally physically organize the classroom that you are working with now, when you want to think about your learning environment, always go to your early years learning framework and also have a look at the national quality framework. Both of those have indicators of how you need to set up the environment. Plus, most of you have done the learning environments unit that spends an entire semester looking at what you're doing and how you set those up. So now our third one that we want to look at is the human resources. So when you're in a um, classroom so a kindy a pre-primary a year one or you're in a childcare setting you are going to have other people that you work with very rarely will you be if you are in an early childhood setting unless you're in mm, probably a year one or year two most of the time if you're in a kindy a pre-primary or in a childcare setting there'll be more than one of you in a classroom at any time so you have to think, what are your human resources? Your main ones are you will more than likely, if you're in a kindy or pre-primary, not necessarily if you're depending on your numbers, but more than likely you have at least one education assistant, which is brilliant, but you need to work out how you're going to work with them. If you have children who have been diagnosed with various special needs, you will have a special needs EA. They might not be there all the time. They might only be there one or two mornings a week. They might be there every morning till lunchtime. It all depends on the funding that the child receives. So don't think that because a child has a diagnosis of autism that you're going to have an EA there all the time. You might only have an EA for a certain amount of time. It all depends on the funding and the school and what the child's diagnosis is. And then your other human resources that you have are your parent helpers. So let's have a look at how this all works. So essentially we have to think if harmonious staff relationships exist, it encourages good working relationships for staff 
but it also makes it nice and positive in a warm environment for the children. So you can't be complaining and whining and gossiping about other people that you work with because it actually is visible to the children when people get on or when they don't get on. So they can see that certain adults in the area are not getting on with one another. They might not be able to articulate it, but they will certainly know. It's the same way that little children know when mum and dad are about to get a divorce because they have picked up on all of the bickering and the fighting that's gone on, even when parents say that they haven't been fighting in front of their children. Same thing happens. Children will pick up when people in the centre are getting on with one another or when they're doing it differently. Hmm. So we've got these human resources. We understand that we need to work with them. We understand that we all need to get on together. So how do we manage all of this? Essentially, as the teacher in the room, you are responsible for the organising and the planning and the understanding of how those human resources are going to work in your classroom. It is your responsibility to work out what you do. So in order to do that, all the adults working in that centre, they have to be clear about what are their roles and what are their duties. So a lot of times we have to think, in reality, how do you define the role of the class education assistant? And sometimes I see that certain teachers think of them as their personal assistant, as opposed to the educational assistant. In reality, the role is that they are designed to be able to work with the children. They're not for you to send them off to do photocopying and all of those. So they should be seen doing lots and lots of things that involve working with the children. However, they shouldn't be chopping up the fruit and always in the kitchen and always cleaning up and everything. That can be part of what you do all together and the children can help with a lot of those things. So your educational assistant is not your personal assistant. They're not the cleaner in the room. They are the person who helps you to work with the children and they are amazing most of the time. So think, how can you organise them to work with small groups? What can you do? How can they help you in the classroom to manage all the children and so on? What do you want them to do on the mat time? What do you want them to do as part of the learning centres? What do you want them to do for setting up outside or helping you with different things? So as a teacher, you need to work out how are you going to lead your team? And your team might just be the one EA that you have for half a day every day. It could be you have one full-time EA and then you have another half-time EA who is speci specifically targeting a particular child who is a bit of a runner that you have. So you've got to work out how it, you're going to all work together. You have to have a degree of openness because everybody has amazing qualities. That's why they're employed at the school. So you have to be very open. Sometimes what you want them to do and what they're able to do and what they like doing are different things. So you need to be very open to communicate about what that could look like because you need to develop that feeling of trust and the idea of a mutual respect. So they need to understand what your role is. You need to understand what their role is. And it's not that you don't cross over, but that you think about how you can manage that effectively. Now, I find that if I sit and I work out what are the routines that we're having in our classroom, how do I want to deal with the behaviour management? How are they comfortable dealing with the behaviour management? And what are we going to do together? We have to be consistent because just like everything, kids will know if you are not consistent. They will look straight at the EA while they're doing something inappropriate and then they'll stop doing it when you walk over and vice versa. So... You have to always understand, though, that you are the person who has the duty of care. So if a parent asks an EA an educational question, they should be referred to you. So go through the expectations. It's fine for a parent to come up and say to your EA, oh, Johnny's not feeling too well today. Can you just give me a phone call if um, he starts to flag as we're going through? Or, you know, we've had a big weekend. Give me a call if he's not coping during the day and so on. They're fine to say, but it shouldn't be that a parent goes over to an EA and asks about their development in writing, for example. That should be a teacher question. And so your EA should be able to direct them and say, oh, 
so-and-so, they'll be with you shortly or do you want to send them an email? They're a bit busy at the moment handling the kids and so on. Or do you want me to get her to send you an email later? So think about how you want to structure that in the right way that will create something you will be comfortable with as well. So what we want to think about is we have to make sure that we are allowing our EAs to develop their own personal skills. So you want to encourage them to attend some professional development days. Now, I find that a lot of times when I'm working with schools, this is not encouraged. And yet for me, working with the technology, I often target the EAs because they might be the person that's sitting with the children, helping them to use their iPads in different ways. So share the duties. The reality is you're actually both responsible for the prep and the pack away. Your EA is not your personal cleaner. And I see this so many times in classrooms where the teacher is, yes, dealing with the kids, but then they never get involved in the pack up and clean up. Clean up. So what we need to do is all do it together. And I often get the kids. They're all doing things with me. We should all be doing it. The kids can also get sponges out. They can start to wipe things down. And then we do the final wipe over as the adults to make sure it's all cleaned up. So think what are you doing to help your assistant feel valued? If they're just standing at the photocopier, photocopying things for an hour or two every day, they're not going to feel very valued. When they're working with the children and you're applauding them for their efforts and they're feeling rewarded by the work, that makes them feel valued. Now, don't dominate them and don't allow yourself to be dominated either. So you've got to get that nice balance. Sometimes you will go in, especially as a young graduate, and you'll be working with an EA who's been working in that classroom for 12 years already. And they will tell you how everything will work. But you need to work out your own systems and processes and you need to work as a team. So the reality is that a lot of your teaching and the success of it depends on your ability to work well with others. And teaching is a very people-oriented field. So we have to think, how we got on with people, that makes a difference. So how do we get started? So you have to make the first move with your EA. So it could be that even before you start, you ask for the phone number of your EA that you're going to be working with and you have a coffee with them and you get to know one another as people first. So think, how do you write down or how do you articulate what are your roles in the classroom? So be very specific. I've had days where I've written it all out and then I've had other EAs that I've worked with where we just had to have conversations about it. So it depends on what you believe and what you want to have happen. Sometimes keeping it specific but casual is good and then you can always go a little bit more formal if need be. I always like to emphasize the idea of teamwork. And so they need to know that we are all working together. I am ultra, ultra organized with storerooms and things like that. And some EAs I worked with, yes, they are. But I'm the one that will go in and I will pull everything out. I will label it all. I will put it in boxes. I will get it 100% organized because that's my love. And so it's teamwork that you want to work together. It's not that your EA has to do all of that all the time. And then I'm someone that believes we have to make sure that we articulate very, very clearly what is our philosophy? What do we believe? What are our procedures? What are our routines? How do we want things to work in our room? You might say that you're getting to school at seven o'clock every morning. So I was always an early bird. But your EA is not paid from 7 o'clock in the morning. Your EA is paid from 8.30 or 8.40 or 8.50, whatever is the time slot that they're paid from. So you shouldn't expect them to be there early. Your philosophy might believe that you need to be there and that's fine. But remember that they are only paid for that certain amount of time. It's a very different pay schedule to the way that a teacher is paid. So now that brings us on to our other human resources that we could have involved. I love this photo. It was from Kid Safe WA. And it's all about families. We want to have families involved. So re research tells us when schools and families work together, children have a much better chance at success, not just at school, but throughout life. 
Now, in fourth year, we do an entire unit, which is all about families and partnerships. So again, not going through this in a huge amount of detail. So when we talk about families, you set the tone of how you want families to interact. So it could be that you have an open door policy, parents are allowed in, it could be that they do drop offs and kiss and ride, whatever is the issue that you would like to have, then you set the tone. Parent helpers, they, they should help you. <laughs> they should improve your learning and your atmosphere and not create chaos, but it's all about the way that you manage it. So I often, when I had pre-primaries, year ones and twos, not a drama. After the first couple of weeks, we had parents in as much as possible. And I would schedule them only one at a time, though. I wouldn't have like three or four in a room. With my kindies, I waited until about week six or seven of term one because I wanted the kindy children to actually get settled first before mum and dad came in because then it upsets the apple cart and they then behave interestingly when mum or dad are there compared to the way that they behave in a classroom when it's only the teacher and the EA. Children have to be comfortable with the routines. So you don't want parents coming in and slightly disrupting things. You've got to have the children comfortable with the routines. And then you also look amazing in front of the parents because the children just move off and do everything so beautifully. So how do we get started with that? So you have to gauge the interest. So depending on the school that you're at. So when I've worked in high socioeconomic schools, it's actually quite tricky to get parents in because they're all working. So you've got to gauge the interest. Consider the activities and the times of day and the number of helpers. Don't schedule something from 10.30 to 12.30. Parents won't come in. Schedule things from straight away where they can drop off their children at the school and then they can just stay. Or schedule them at quarter past two where they can come early, stay for the next 45 minutes and then they can take their children home. So think about those sorts of things. I always numbered charts and I would put them on my door outside. So that way they knew that there was one or two or three people who we needed for certain things. I always meet with the parents in the first week or two. Uh, when I had kindies or, and pre-kindies, I met with them in the term before they started. And anyone that's going to help, I have a little document where we just go through the fact that they have to be confidential. So they can't take photos of children. They can't write things. They shouldn't do a Facebook update that says they're in the school. But also that confidentiality applies to the work that the children are doing as well. So they shouldn't go home and say to their best friends, oh my goodness, you should see the work that Sarah does. It's so bad. And my little Molly is doing such a better job. That should not be part of the way that you want things to happen. So I just have a little chat with all the parents, particularly the parents who are very regular. I make sure they really understand the idea of confidentiality and so on. Because I have had parents come in and go through my daily work pad, have a look at everything. They've flicked open on my record sheets and they just need to understand those sorts of things are not okay. So what are the benefits when we get parents involved? Oh my goodness, huge amount. Basically, for the parents, it increases their confidence and they understand how school works. They feel valued about their role in the child's life. They get that idea of what school is compared to home. And of course, it improves your relationship with the parents. For the children, it helps them to understand that school and family are separate but together helps them develop a good sense of pride in the work that they're doing. I find it gives them much better attendance and overall improved behaviour. For the teachers, it certainly helps having extra parents around because I will schedule them on for a particular activity. It allows me to have that little bit more time with certain individuals. I get to know all the families. I would make a chart up on the back of the door where the parents couldn't see it and I would have the child's name and then I would have mum and dad's name. So every time I walked in, I would have it all there ready so that when a parent dropped them off and if uh, grandma or auntie was a regular drop off or wanted to come on duty, I would write their name up as well. So that way I'd remember their names and so on. Um, I would observe the interactions between the adult and the child. Sometimes that gives you such a good level of information about what's going on at home. So when it comes to our time management, you have to think 
with parents as well as with your EAs, what are you getting them to do during DOT? So if it is an EA for a particular child, it might be that they go to music with that child. If it's an EA for the class, they might be doing certain things in DOT. Rosters like duty rosters, all those sorts of things, do you include the EAs or not? That's a, often a school-based decision. And indoor and outdoor times. So EAs are um, can be considered part of the ratios of the adults in there. So you need to be aware of who you're scheduling on at different times. And then do you want them involved during whole class time? Do you want them on the mat with you? Do you want them setting up the tables? How do you want that to organise? And the same with your small group times. What do you want to have happen during those? So let's go through main parts of our lecture. Essentially, effective planning can minimise our behaviour issues. So plan for the problems and minimise them. You might not be able to get rid of them, but you can definitely minimise them. Think about how you set your environment up. Make sure it suits the needs of the children, suits your curriculum, suits your personal philosophy. Human resources are very valuable, so be aware of them and plan for them. EAs are not your personal assistant, so work with them to create the best working environments. Parents can be an amazing resource. Plan for how and when you want to use them in the classroom. So when we're thinking about our planning, remember we had those three areas of behaviour, your environment and your human resources. This is all about the human resources that we've got to make sure we take into account and how we actually plan for them when we're writing our forward planning documents and lesson plans. All right, let's have a look at our week 11 tutorials. So Monday tutorial, I will meet you at uni at 10.30. We will be there for our final planning session before the next uh, two school-based sessions. Tuesday tutorial, woo! You guys are heading off to the school. So get to the school around 1.30. I've sent you an email, a couple of emails already. Make sure people collect and return all the equipment. And remember, have lots of fun. You're going to love it. So week 12 lecture is on action research and planning for early intervention. So that will be pre-recorded and uploaded on the Sunday night as usual. And I'll also do a short bit on the assignment clarification. Week 13 is all going to have lots and lots of information about assignment explanations and set up and the things that we want to have included. And so you can basically follow along so that you can get things done. We will also have a number of different avenues for you to ask questions because I know that people are getting a bit concerned. But remember that we've got face to face because we have our school based lessons. So I'm thinking that either before or after, hang around, ask us questions and then you'll be able to clarify anything that you need. All right, so I'm so looking forward to seeing how all of the school based lessons go and have a fabulous time and I will talk to you all soon.